We're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. It is only for our love and friendships do we create the illusion that for the moment, we're not alone. We're off to a happy start, aren't we? That is a quote from Orson Welles, a famous American actor. In 2010, a study conducted by the AARP Foundation reported that more than a third of the adults that are over the age of 45 are lonely. And in 2018, although the reported percentage still remained at 35%, the population of the over 45 age group has increased substantially over the course of eight years, meaning that currently there are 48 million adults in total that are lonely. But the bad news is that the feeling that is loneliness is actually a detriment to the well-being of our body and mind. Sigmund Freud, an Austrian neurologist and the founder of psychoanalysis, linked anxiety to solitude in one of his studies, stating that in children, one of the first phobias relating to situations are those of darkness and solitude. It has appeared that loneliness is on its rise to become an epidemic. Furthermore, I personally believe the argument that no one is even immune to loneliness because just like death, it is currently a constant and unremovable aspect of human lives, completely inborn into the very core of our being and unavoidable. We are fated to be lonely from the moment of our birth and to the end of our mortal lives. And from what all the studies, philosophies, and what I have told you so far, it sounded extremely morbid, right? That horrible, horrible feeling of isolation that is widespread and inescapable will never stop slowly chipping away at your sanity until death frees you from its grip. <laughs> well, if that's the case, I wouldn't be here talking about this now. From, uh, you see, being a if we cannot change the fact that all of us will encounter isolation, we change our response to it. Being alone is a state. It is being on one's own and having no one's around. But loneliness, loneliness is a negative response to being alone. So we just have to find a positive response, don't we? From June of last year, I started experiencing intense loneliness. Throughout the last two years, all of my friends have been accepted due to schools across the states of America and left Shenzhen one by one. And that is the first time I've dealt with being lonely. Not a joyful experience at all. It is something that continuously forces you to obsessively reevaluate your self-value over and over and over. My self-esteem, not high to begin with, plummeted to a new low and decided to dug a hole and to call its home in the deepest spot of the Earth's core. And as times go on, a thought came into my mind. What if I actively pursue solitude? If I can adapt to the mindset that happiness doesn't have to derive solely from companionship, that perhaps this can ease up the hollow feeling of loneliness that I have raked up over the past few months. If I get all this time by myself now, why don't I treasure and adore it, try to see it in a different light? This is called voluntary solitude. Solitude, as many of you know, refers to feeling peaceful and quiet with nothing but ourselves and our own thought. Voluntary solitude, unlike loneliness, doesn't have negative health consequences. It is the positive response to being alone. Many studies over the years started to conclude that, ironically, when pursued by choice, solitude can help you build social connection. And that is because by choosing to be by ourselves, we are giving ourselves time to introspectively learn about who we are, reflect, and define our identity. This period of self-discovery, in terms, helps with building relationships in the future. Turkle, the author of the book, Alone Together, writes, how do you get from connection to isolation? You ended up isolated if you don't cultivate the capacity for solitude, the ability to be separate, to gather yourself. Solitude is where you find yourself so you can reach out to other people and form real attachments. When we don't have the capacity for solitude, we turn to other people in order to feel less anxious or more alive. When this happens, we're not able to appreciate fully who they really are. It's as still we're using them as spare parts to support our fragile sense of self. Studies conducted by Julie Bowsker 
concludes that healthy solitude could enhance our creativity. It frees the mind from the distractions of everyday life and allows it to focus full more fully on one thing. It allows our brain to come up with extraordinary, unique solutions to ordinary problems. I'll let all of that sink in for a moment. If we now know the, the benefits of intentional solitude, what if all of us try to voluntarily isolate ourselves from time to time? It could be sim something as simple as 10 minutes in the morning where we sit by ourselves with nothing but our own thoughts. These moments of solitude, even small ones, when self-imposed, intentional, and fully appreciated, can have profound effects on our creative thinking and productivity. So, but most importantly, most importantly, loneliness and the solitude could be the answer to our current loneliness epidemic. So if all of us could try to transform our loneliness into solitude, let us all be the geniuses that solve this medical health crisis by embracing moments of quiet and seclusion. Thank you for listening.